we lose some. There, there, there. These guys are the worst. This episode of Suspenders of Belief is brought to you by Club Formosa for the hottest jazz in New York City. I'm Heavy. And I'm Traby. And today we watched Motherless Brooklyn. Now, what is Motherless Brooklyn about? Well, Motherless Brooklyn is a neo-noir film. A private investigator with Tourette syndrome seeks to discover who murdered his mentor. Yeah, it seems pretty straightforward at first, right? This movie is really interesting. I think the backstory of the film is fascinating. Right after finishing wrapping up American History X, Edward Norton acquired the rights to adapt Motherless Brooklyn from a book into a film, and he was just very, very passionate about it. And over the past 20 years or so, he's been kind of working on it in the background. Uh, originally, he did want to have a couple of other directors in mind to shoot the film, but then he was kind of talked into shooting it himself. So Edward Norton wrote, directed, produced, and stars in this film. It's the biggest passion project I've ever seen from such a A-list celebrity. Yeah, this is only like a second directorial movie and a lot of the a-list people that worked on it for very little money is almost as like a favor to him because it is such a passion product that he was working on and i feel like that comes through because the quality of it you can't deny like it's very well shot it's very beautiful in a lot of ways there's not a whole lot of effect shots it's all very grounded very realistic there's one shot where it just looks like legitimate antique cars that they're driving around right that beauty shot when they're going across the bridge and there's so many different types of vehicles too a lot of times when you do have a movie that's clearly been sponsored by audi or or so and so forth like the police cars the taxis the regular cars the richer cars the poorer cars like everyone happens to have the same make if you're paying attention and that's a, that's a little odd there's a great bit in the beginning where one of the cars rams into another car and there's no visible damage whatsoever yeah in a movie in modern times that would feel like a plot hole or like why is the bumper hanging off or something but cars in the 50s they didn't care they were heavy steel oh yeah because originally the book was published in 99 and set in 99 right and Norton pushed for it to be a period piece in the 50s. And that I appreciate because it gives that movie just this extra little bit of texture, this extra little bit of flavor that is fun to live in, even though the story is noir, you know, it's kind of bleak and kind of downplayed, but it's a fun world to live in. The acting in the movie was phenomenal. There were some really solid heavy hitters, some really grounded performances. Alec Baldwin knocks it out of the park, being intimidating and threatening. I've, I've never seen Alec Baldwin do such a serious role and he kills it. Either I get city planning or I quit the other two right now. Yeah, he does a really excellent job with this. Most everybody does pretty well. Um, not to take anything away from our lead, most of the time when you see Tourette's characterized in pop culture, it's just the profanity. It's just an excuse to have somebody say profanity or whatever's on their mind. And there's a little bit of that in this. There's some funny Freudian moments where he slips through and says what's on his mind, and it's pretty funny. Hot tits on my milky tea face. Don't blame the way. Sugar tits on my milk face. Someone with his head. But for the most part, it's played as like he's like he describes in the movie, like it's an itch in his brain that he has to scratch, whether it's through his motions or his movement or specific phrases that he says. It's not just like, I'm going to say profanity now. It's like, no, no, no. It's it's played into my eyes, to my, you know, uneducated eyes. Realistically, it doesn't feel like he's leaning into it in such a way that makes you feel that it's exploitive. And the Tourette's angle of it plays into it thematically as well, right? which I appreciated. It didn't feel like it was just tacked on for the hell of it. I, I did like that you did have some characters who would treat him as a freak some people like some of his closest friends were probably the meanest to him a lot of times strangers might like raise an eyebrow and be like okay dude you, you all right? But then there were other characters who didn't know him at all that really sympathized with him. And, I, and I, I mentioned it while we were watching it, but I love it in stories where broken characters find other broken characters and have sympathy for him. Because so many times we're watching movies or just living in the world and it's so bleak and it's so miserable and everyone's hating each other all the time. So those little type of human connection moments really resonated with me. The jazz music of the film takes a, a big part of the story and the lead jazz musician has that tender moment with Edward Norton's character. And I, I just love that. I love that moment. Yeah, that was great because when you first see him, you think maybe he's going to be antagonistic. Edward Norton is in this jazz bar and he's kind of out of his element. He's like, he might be the only white dude in there, but also he's got Tourette's, so he's he's acting out a little bit. And the jazz music is kind of triggering him a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you're worried, you're like, oh no, this is a tense moment. Well, immediately after that, there is a bit of a violent scene, but it's unrelated to what was just happening necessarily. And then when you meet back up with, with the lead musician, they have a bond and they connect to each other and it's really nice. Right. 
Something about um, the older you get, the more you respond to kindness in movies. You actually end up feeling more of an emotional response when a person is kind, because I guess, unfortunately, reality of existence is that's more rare, so you respond to it better. Now, we mentioned the acting in the movie was, for the most part, pretty solid. I know when we watched it, one actress in particular stuck out to you. I mean, I like Leslie Mann. She's fine. And her the way she affects her voice and her cadence and everything is really good for this movie, but there's just like one string of lines when she's grieving for spoiler alert Bruce Willis's character I don't even want to know always with this cryptic shit telling me he's into something big this time that felt that just missed the mark completely it was too over the top and it to her the way she said it it sounded like she was nearly laughing and almost smiling while she was grieving over her husband and it just it totally missed for me it was nice to see bruce willis trying he didn't seem like a tired old man just looking for a paycheck like he was genuinely bringing something for as short as he was in the movie right it was nice to see bruce willis trying he wasn't in the film for a particularly long time but anytime he actually does put any kind of effort into it he, he does shine as like oh he is a good actor he just unfortunately is too many times just in a movie to be in the movie i guess he's bored but no, he does a good job this. He says yes a lot, and I don't know what his story is exactly. Um, like, I know Nick Cage goes through money. I was going to say, not as bad as Nicolas Cage. Right. But there's a lot of, if you go to the red box, there's a lot of direct-to-DVD things that are like, what? And he's like on the cover. And if you watch the movie, yeah, he's in it for like 10 minutes total. Like, they shot his scenes in a day and just cut him in sporadically. Be seeing ya. Yeah, I hope not sporadically. The other thing that I would say about creativity associated with this movie is as creative as it is, if you were a fan of the book and you went in to see this movie, you'd probably be really disappointed because it's an incredibly liberal adaptation of the book. Other than a couple of key characters, almost everything else is thrown out the window and this is an entirely new story. And you can argue the pros or cons on that, but I was just one of the things I wanted to mention is if you were a big fan of Motherless Brooklyn, be prepared that this is not the same story that you read. It seems like the main character carried over and not a whole lot else. You would think that like the plot or Laura, who's played by Gugu Mbatara, you would think that as, as vital as she is to the story that that was lifted straight from the book, but apparently that was an invention. Even the villain, uh, Alec Baldwin's character, Moses Randolph, who's based on a real life person, yeah, this is a totally different interpretation of what the source material is. There were moments that specifically reminded me of Chinatown. There were moments that reminded me of even Citizen Kane, specifically the Formosa. That really felt like a Citizen Kane kind of moment. Uh, a rosebud. Yeah, a rose, that makes but sense. you get this little clue and you're kind of in the back of your brain trying to think of like, this has got to be important. It's got to be important. And then the reveal, which uh, I guess I won't, I won't spoil just in case anyone is interested in watching this movie. I definitely think it's worth the watch. Sure. It has such a simple solution, I guess, similar to Rosebud, where you, you don't overthink it. <laughs> it's not a password. It's not a, you know, a, a big solution to anything. This movie is very well executed, but the, the one negative thing I would say about it is that it's just we've seen this before not necessarily done better it's just that i've seen this before this is well made but it's almost like i want to say comfort food in that capacity but it's not because you're not really having a great time watching this movie as dark and as miserable as a lot of the subject matter is but uh it's just very familiar and very very well done well other than the main character of lionel a lot of the other characters do kind of feel like placeholders you know you, you have frank who like we said is not in the movie for very long but he's basically just a person who took Lionel and a couple of other misfits in to run this business, which is a car delivery company. Really, it's a front for private investigation. And then you have this whole subplot about integration of diversity, and you have the big tyrant builder who's making all these housing developments into slums, particularly over like racial profiling. And you have all this going on during the big story, and it's not entirely clear how they're connected, at least initially. And as the story kind of unfolds, it becomes a little more connected, and there's a, a bigger story that evolves. But one of the things about the noir in general is that they're very downbeat but i will say the conclusion is surprisingly upbeat for a noir movie yeah i have to give it that much um i've read something somewhere that noir sometimes can be partially uh defined through nihilism mm -hmm. and a lot of the ones that we've seen and kind of on a downer note you know sometimes the main characters are together sometimes they're not sometimes they're alive sometimes they're dead and this one ends relatively positively not to get too much in the spoiler town but yeah i've just seen so many noir films where the cliche that the bad guy gets away with it the good guys can't stop him or the good guys end up dead or arrested or blamed etc so it's one of those that noir never really has a oh well, that wrapped up nicely and this movie does carry some of that i'm not going to say that it's it's perfectly resolved and, and all the good guys win because it really wouldn't feel like noir 
noir movie if it ended that way. It can't really end up too sunshiny. But just as a comparison, in the book, the love interest leaves him, his friends are all dead or missing, and he's kind of just lost. Yeah, and to just delicately touch on the plot, it is about gentrification, and it's set in the 50s, so our hero is not going to fix racism right. in the 50s at the end of this movie, so that you just have to kind of go into it knowing what to expect. As a matter of fact, at the beginning of the movie, there's this little allegory about um, Edward Norton when he's uh, talking about his sweater. He's pulling at a thread on his sweater. It works into the movie as an allegory as well, his Tourette's, because he is basically like an itch that he's got to scratch, and he keeps pulling at the thread. But the guy next to him is all like, oh, you keep pulling on the thread, you're going to make a mess of things. It's like an itch that has to be scratched. Quit pulling on it, you're going to make a fucking mess out of things. Well, I definitely enjoyed the film, and I, I will read watch it again i find the backstory some of the setup almost as interesting as the film itself but what would you rate this film this is definitely if it's on cable i'll watch it again you know i recommend it to people and things like that but it's not something i personally need a copy of i have seen movies like american history x fantastic film i could not recommend watching it every day that would not put you in a good mindset I really liked Hereditary, which came out the past couple of years, and it's um, the more I watch it, the less effective it is because it's a horror movie, goofy camp pop culture stuff for a lot of the things that I like. So that's stuff that I would definitely buy a copy of, you know, regardless of format and things like that. Bye.